Good afternoon, everyone. This is Paul Purdue from Turning Computer Systems, and this is the June 2009 Water Cooler, which is our new name for the virtual user group. And today we are talking about credit card processing and convert to fee settings in Practice Master. And I think that we flipped a coin, and I think that I lost, and Mary Jo elected them that I would go first. So I am going to start by talking about credit card processing. Now, just a few for people that are new, a few people, uh, a few things to housekeeping wise. Uh, if you're new and you don't have to get rid of that big blue box that's taking up about a quarter of your screen, uh, you'll notice that jutting out to the left of it is a smaller rectangular box that has just a couple icons on it. Uh, the one at the top, it looks like arrows pointing to the right, and if you will click those arrows that point to the right, that big blue box should slide all the way out of the way. Um, also on that little, and all that will, once you do that, all that will be left is the little rectangular box. You can move up and down by grabbing it at the top. And also on that little blue rectangular box that's to the left, or that shuts off to the side, um, is a hand icon. We have everybody muted so that only Mary Jo and I can talk uh, because we like to talk. And uh, if you have a question, if you will click that little hand icon, it will raise your hand, we'll see that, we'll unmute you, and you can ask a question. Now, there also is a place where you can type in questions. So if you prefer not to talk, you just want to ask a question, you can type it in. We'll see that, and we'll answer that question. So I'm going to start by talking about credit card processing. Credit card processing was new in version 13.1. If you received a CD from STI, you should have credit card processing and, and, and installed it, received it and installed it. If you received your 15.1 update disk, I think they just called it version 15 update disk, uh, and installed it, you should have credit card processing. If you bought brand new software when version 15.1 was just released, there's a possibility that you do not have the version that includes credit card processing, even though you have version 15.1. And therefore, if you find that what we're telling you to do to unlock it uh, or to even see if it's there doesn't work, then all you need to do is let me know or let STI know, and they will ship you a new copy of the software with that credit card processing. I think, actually, once you have 15.1, if you just upgrade to 15.2, you automatically get it. Uh, but let us know. We'll make sure. Now, if you have 15.2, not an issue. As you know, if you attended the last virtual user group meeting or the last water cooler, we went over all the features in 15.2, so it is out right still also. Um, now, there are a couple things I want to make clear about credit card processing. It's really cool. It works directly in the payment screen. You click on a customer and enter a payment for them, uh, or go into payments directly and, and select a customer or a client and then enter a payment for them. If you select credit card, it will pop up a screen where you put in the details of charges of right then and there, and it's done. Uh, you do need to be using First National Merchant Services in Omaha, Nebraska. They did not pick First National because it's about an hour away from Lincoln, Nebraska. I picked First National because they are one of the top providers of electronic credit card processing in the country. Their rates are very attractive, and they were able to negotiate even better rates for people that use tips. Uh, and they have the security tools in place so that SCI meets all the standards, TAPS 3, I should say, meets all the standards for very secure credit card processing. So while you do need to switch merchant providers, you do not need to switch banks. A lot of people have that misconception. Many don't, but many do. Uh, you can have the same bank account. You can even continue to use on the side for whatever purpose the old merchant account that you have but you do need to also establish a merchant account with merchant, uh, First National Merchant Services. Uh, if you want to look further into this, we ask, and we won't charge you anything for this, but we ask that you contact us and we put you in touch with uh, the right people at First National based on where you are and uh, uh, what size merchant caps that you use. So all you need to do is send an email to me, all that for you at attorneycomputersystems.com or to STI, uh, spells at tabs3.com, and they'll put me in touch with the right people at First National Merchant Services. Um, 
a little housekeeping first. We're going to go into the um, utilities maintenance tab, and from there we're going to go into customization. And you'll notice, uh, you'll know right off if you have credit card processing if you have this merchant services tab. If you don't have this tab, then you don't have the version of tabs that allows credit card processing, and all you need to do is update the latest version. If we'll click on this tab now, we'll see that there's a checkbox that we check to enable processing. And once we do that, these three buttons, or actually four buttons, pop uh, into being active. And there are three places where you can set up accounts. And I want to talk about this for a second. There's a firm account. And most of us just have one firm account. Uh, Jones, Jones, and Jones charges credit cards as Jones, Jones, and Jones. We also have the ability to set up separate accounts for each location and the ability to set up separate accounts for each timekeeper. Some firms do this. We have a lot of clients that are really shell firms. Uh, they have a name. They, they, they have a common letterhead and, and a lot of common things, but they're really just individual attorneys. And so they, each individual attorney will have its own uh, merchant processing account and tabs is set up to him. Uh, we also have the ability to do it by location. We have some firms that have multiple locations and still have one processing account. But we also have clients that have multiple locations and have different processing accounts for each location. So the system is set up to handle all these different scenarios. Now, what you'll find when you go in there is pretty much the same thing. So we're going to click on the firm account, and we're going to set it up real quick. Uh, we're going to put in a fake PayFuse client ID. You would put in your actual PayFuse. That's the name of the processing platform that First National Merchant Services uses. So we're just going to put in 1234569. Uh, we're going to put in a demo account for the description. Uh, for the user account, we're going to put in demo, our user ID demo, password. Uh, I'm just going to put 1234, and I'm going to confirm it as 1234. Now, um, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, American Express, you simply need to tell the system what you're accepting. Some people only accept Visa MasterCard. Others uh, may accept American Express or may not, may accept Discover or may not. Frankly, I don't know anybody that accepts Diners Club. Every time I see the word Diners Club, I think of my dad who's just turned 88 and it's still a, a patent attorney in Toledo, Ohio. And for some reason, when I see that name, I think of him. I think maybe he had a Diners Club card when I was five years old. Uh, honestly, I don't, I, I don't even know. If, I, I guess they must still exist or else we wouldn't put it. But basically, you select whichever credit card you're going to use and say OK. Uh, you can test the account. We'll go ahead and do that real quick. And what it'll do is it'll fail. Um, so once you put in your real stuff, see it says it's invalid, the ID is invalid, the whatever is invalid. We don't care because we're just playing around. But once you put in your real information, you'll want to use the test account button and verify that it recognizes you. Uh, it goes out to the internet, makes a connection to PayFuse, and verifies all the information. Make sure it's set correctly. So we'll go ahead and click OK. And, and now we're just going to go ahead and make a payment. I want to show you how this works. That's about all we're going to do today in the, in the water cooler meeting. Uh, you can go ahead and play with this to your heart's content. As you see, all we're doing is putting in some, um, we're going to skip off there. Um, all we're doing is putting in some fake information. Like now, uh, we're going to go ahead and choose somebody that has a balance. And I, I think, yeah, which side carries a balance. Uh, we're going to go ahead and use whatever payment code we want. We're going to put in whatever amount we want. We're going to do everything exactly the way we're used to. And frankly, this credit card item has been here, too, all along. And some of you are used to selecting credit card as receipt type. We're going to go ahead and select credit card. We're going to save payment. And when we do, it doesn't do anything because for some reason we don't have it set up for it. OK. When we do, um, what would happen, <laughs> I'm going to wing it here, is that a box would pop up allowing you to put in the credit card number, the expiration date, the three-digit security code, or if it's an American Express, the four-digit security code. It would default to having the client name and address and would give you a place to put in the uh, the name on the card. You could change the client's name and address if the information is different than what you have on account. And it would have a button to, to save it. And when it did, it would go out and process the charge. Plain and simple, when it's done, it comes back uh, to entering a new payment. 
and you're done. Now, what happens, therefore, is that when you save a payment as a credit card payment, it's been processed, and everything else that goes along with it is uh, going to happen automatically. For instance, if we go within the time period that's allotted that allows us to void a transaction that's a credit card transaction, and we go and delete this payment, it's going to go out and void the credit card transaction. If we have gone past, and I believe it's three days that you can void a credit card transaction, maybe it's two days, I'm, not, I'm really not entirely certain. But if we've gone beyond that period and we go and delete that payment, it will actually go out and create a credit transaction to reverse that. So everything at this point, once you make a credit card transaction in the payment screen, everything that you do to that payment is tied to that credit card account. So that you can't delete the payment without crediting the card. You can't change the amount of the payment without issuing some sort of credit to the card, and it all happens automatically. So gone are the days where you have to go here and go here and go here in order to do anything related to the credit card. If you're using pay fuse and tabs, everything that you do is going to be tied automatically to that. OK, Any Paul, questions? I'm going to interrupt you for just a moment. You have a, a question from uh, Bill Perdue. So I'm going to unmute you, Bill, so you can ask your question. Uh, Are you there, Bill? Can you hear me? We can hear you. OK, uh, Paul, I just wondered, in the event that you are posting payments for uh, multiple cases on behalf of the same client. In other words, uh, let's say we have a client with uh, five open cases and he wants to pay his entire balance. Do you, am I understanding correct that you would need to uh, render five different charges to that credit card or is there a way to consolidate them? You would need to re render five different charges to the credit card. That's unfortunate. Yeah, that is, right now that's the way it's set up. So if you've got a client with multiple accounts and they are paying uh, multiple accounts with one credit card transaction, it's really not going to happen. It's going to show up and, and charge. I'm going to send a wish list request. Yeah, that's a good idea. And anybody that doesn't know what that is, all you do is send an email to wishlist at tabs3.com saying, hey, this is great, but you always start it with a nice thing. Hey, this is great, but it would be even better if we could do it this way and have one transaction and have it spread over multiple accounts. I agree wholeheartedly. And one thing that we ask people to do when they wish list something with Tabs 3, if you will carbon copy us or blind carbon copy, whatever you prefer, we will request the same thing on your behalf. And what happens then is that STI is getting two wish list requests, one from a reseller, one from a client. Uh, it, almost more than doubles the effect of the wish list request if both of us request it. So, Bill, if you go ahead and wish list that and carbon copy me, I will be sure to do the same thing. Okay, you better move me again in case uh, Dave comes down. Yeah. <laughs> That's my brother, Bill. Bill, are you still there? Yes. Do you know, does John still have a Diners Club card? No. No, okay. Well, I've got I don't know here. anybody that carries those anymore. I don't either. My curiosity is peaked. I'm going to have to do some research on that. Well, if we don't have any more questions, um, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Jo, who is going to talk about convert to fee settings in Practice Master. And if you know what that means, pay close attention because she may show you some things that have changed in previous versions or in uh, since previous versions. And if you have no idea what it means, pay even closer attention because it's really cool. Mary Jo? Okay, I'm going to go into Practice Master. And Practice Master has the capability of converting any of your calendar records, your journal entries, your timer records, any of those things that you keep track of throughout the, uh, the course of a day or a week or a month. Um, and by simply clicking on a convert to fee um, and the quick clicks, you can convert any of those to a fee, give it a new description that will actually show up on the bill. Um, briefly, I can go in and I can show you uh, that. I'm going to just choose a client here. Um, and let's go into our Woodside Terrace client here and see if I've got, um, here I've got some journal records in here. So you can see that I've got a complaint that I prepared. And I can either, on my quick clicks, go over and there is a convert to fee setting uh, box over here. And as I've got that note highlighted, um, I can click on convert to fee. And it's going to take me right into um, a fee window. 
And this looks just like the fee window that you're used to seeing in Practice Master. Um, and then I can go in, I can put the hours work that it took me to prepare that complaint. Um, and then I can change and modify the description if I needed to, um, especially if this was a journal note and I took like two paragraphs of notes on what I discussed with the client. That doesn't need to show up on the bill. I can modify it here and that will be the description that stays on the bill um, without losing my journal note that I'd originally created. So you can kind of pare that down and, you know, instead of two progressive notes, it might just say conference call with client. Um, and then you can save that and then tabs will go ahead and convert that to a fee. What I'm going to talk to you about today is when you open that window, how does it know, you know, who the default timekeeper is? Or can I set settings for, you know, the calendar that are different than um, journal notes? Or you know maybe I want it to always be the primary timekeeper on the case that I'm going to have um, be the timekeeper. Or you know there's a lot of different settings that I have control of when this window opens. Um, so I'm going to show you where to go to convert those. I'm going to just exit out of this, and I'm going to go up to maintenance, the top here, the toolbar, and I can go to preferences, and there's a convert to fee setting preferences. And when I come in here, you can see that I've got several tabs across the top for each of the different areas that I want to set up. I've got it for calendar, email, notes, phone, research, and timer. So each different type of record, I can set up different parameters that I want um, for my preferences. I can have a default, uh, transaction code uh, be assigned. If I want it to always say a certain thing on my fees for a calendar code, I could choose a transaction code that uh, reflects that. If, it, if I am using task-based billing, I can go ahead and choose the phase or the task or the activity that I want for that particular um, journal entry or calendar entry. I can tell it who I want the default timekeeper to be. If I always want to use myself as the timekeeper when I'm converting these fees, I can say always use timekeeper, um, I believe I'm number four in this setting. Um, I can say timekeeper used for the last fee, or I can always say default to the client's primary timekeeper. Um, so, and this is all set up by user, so if I set mine up to say that I want it to always use timekeeper number four, and Paul wanted to set up his system to always use timekeeper number whatever he is, he can go ahead and do that on his system and have totally separate settings. So it's all user based. So when you come in here, keep that in mind. Um, you have a default description. I can always use what the description field is that's uh, defined for the case. I can use the transaction activity code or the transaction code activity code description, or I can use a customized description, and I can edit that if I want to here. I can also come down here to the converting calendar records into one fee if I want to have a minimum amount of time to bill. If I want to do this and only, always bill in tenths of hours, and even if I only spent two minutes on you know this particular item, if I wanted to always in, bill in increments of tenths of hour. Um, with a minimum there, I can say that, and I can also round it to the nearest tenth of an hour um, and make those settings. Um, and then I have a checkbox here, when possible, convert calendar records without displaying the fee window. So if I don't want to see that fee window, I could check that, and I could have calendar records just go ahead and convert. So those are some settings for the calendar. If I go to email, you can see I've got some different um, some, a few different things, a lot of the same. Again, I can do transaction codes. I can do phase tasks if there is a task-based billing client. I can do my timekeeper, my description. And again, I can do in time to bill in so many hours, or I can combine multiple records to one fee. So if I have several calendar entries that I've done in that day, I can combine them for a total of so many hours. Um, so there's some other settings here that, um, you know, in email that's a little different than the calendar. Um, and then if I go to notes, you're going to see, again, I'll have those increments of tens of hours or things like that that I want to bill. Um, so each different type of task, um, phone task, again, has duration. So you have um, minimum time to bill, again, tens of hours, or to round to the tens of hours, and so on. And you have to go through and define each one of these um, tabs to what you prefer. And then once you get all done and you have all of your settings here, you can go ahead and say OK, and um, that will save those settings for you. So then when I come in here and if I wanted to convert um, that same uh, fee here, I can go to convert to fee and you can see, well, I think I have to get back out here. I don't know if I saved my, my original timekeeper to me in my notes. So let me go back to my settings so I can show you in a, um, on my notes. See, I still have timekeeper number one. So let me do night timekeeper number four and let me say okay. And now when I come in and open this note, 
um, and convert it to a fee, you can see that it's got my timekeeper as me now for the setting that I had done. And then I can manually put in the hours worked, or if, um, I, if I'm using a timer record, I can have it go ahead and you know, do that minimum of a tenth of an hour or whatever I've set up in my convert to be settings. So just a few um, you know, notes in here of what you can do so you can customize the look of your client um, or your convert to be settings uh, screen. And if I come down to, I'm going to go into um, a client that's not a task-based billing client just to um, go over and see if I've got some journal records in here. And if I go to convert to fee settings, and again, you can see it looks a little, you know, pretty much the same. You can come in and um, it, on any of my records, it will go in and put me as a timekeeper in whatever settings I have defined. Any questions on how to change your convert to fee settings screen? Speak now or forever hold your fee. <laughs> it's not Very difficult to do. Um, you can get into it again by going up to maintenance, into your preferences, or if I were on my notes screen here or in my journal record, I can right click and I can also get to it. It will open a, a window that I can get to the convert to, convert to fee settings box. So there's two different ways you can get in there. Um, to change those settings. And again, just remember it is by user, so if you change it on your computer for one thing and you go to another and are working, it's not going to, you know, if somebody else signs on, they're not going to have the same one. They'll have to do their own. We have just a couple minutes left, so I'm going to give my spiel that I usually give when I talk about this because I think it's important to note that um, typically lawyers do not like to log time. I don't think I've ever said that and had a lawyer disagree with me. They do it because they have to. However, typically lawyers love to memorialize things and that's what we're doing here in Practice Master. We are taking emails and tagging them to the case and maybe even making annotations about how that relates. We're taking notes about a phone call we had or about the hearing we attended or about the client meeting we had. We are logging records that record the journal of uh, the uh, the legal research that we did and our notes about that research. Lawyers love to do that. That's what Practice Master is about. And what this convert to fee does is gives them the ability to do those things that they already love to do and to automatically convert them into fees. Now, what Mary Jo showed you was how you can right click on uh, an item or highlight an item and go into quick clicks and choose convert to fee. But we also have something called the process timer records routine. And if we click on the file uh, menu item, uh, it will, right up there, yeah, that's it. And then process timer records. Practice Master will show us all the things we've done in relation to things that can be converted to fees since the last time we ran it. So think about that for a second. You've either got a lawyer who spends his or her whole day doing things and then hopefully remembering to write them down on a timesheet or enter them directly into tabs or enter them in practice master at the time, or we've got a lawyer who simply works practice master the way they hopefully are already doing it, by already journalizing and memorializing all the calendar items and tasks. And uh, you know, if, if, if you have a hearing in the calendar, it's going to show up here because it's now done. If you check off three different tasks of things that you did that day, it's going to show up here. They are going to show up here because they are things that you did that day. If you make notes about a phone call or notes about some research or notes about an email that you're tagging to a case, those are all going to show up here, and at the end of the day then, or even twice a day, uh, a lawyer can come in here and say, oh, I'd like to bill for this, I'd like to bill for this, I'm not going to bill for this. You'll notice at the bottom, if we check this first item over here, um, and then down at the bottom, these three item, these three buttons pop up, convert to fee, combine to fee, which means we may want to take three different items from the list above and combine them into one fee entry, or mark as hidden. That just means I'm not going to bill for this. So when a lawyer gets done running through this list, he or she should have an empty list, and everything that they did should be billed for. So that's another way to look at it. Now, if you're fortunate enough to have 
a firm where lawyers are actually using Practice Master to memorialize everything and to tag all the emails and to do everything in Practice Master, you have the luxury of being able to show them how to come in here and turn that into time automatically. And I think that's very powerful because lawyers, as I say, don't really like to record their time, but most every lawyer I've met has a legal pad somewhere within arm's reach whenever you're talking to them, and that's because they love to memorialize and journalize the things that they're doing on cases. Practice Master gives them a place to do that and to turn it into time. Okay, Paul, we do have one question, and um, it, uh, someone has asked me, um, how do you know if these records have been processed or not from that screen that we were on? Well, while we're on this screen that Paul is showing you, um, I'm going to tell you the status box right here either has a U or a P in it. U is for unprocessed, P is for processed. If it is a U, that means that you have not converted it to a fee yet. And I'm going to close this and go back out to my note screen, and again, you can see the status box is there as well. And if I take this first one um, and I go to my quick clicks and I convert that to a fee, and I'm going to go ahead and do it, I'm just going to say that it was an hour's worth of time and save it. And then if I come back out, you can see now that there is a P in the status. That has been processed. It's a process timer record. Um, the other two down here still have a U. I have not processed them and converted them to a fee. So those are U settings until that's done. Good question. Very good. Very good question. Any other questions? Any other questions? Wouldn't be the end of a water group or water cooler group virtual user group meeting if I didn't ask any other lawyer jokes. Nope. Okay. I think that's it then. We are done with the June 2009 water cooler. Uh, Mary Jo, do you remember what the topics are we picked for the next virtual user group meeting? Uh. No, I don't. I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm only going to come out of You can't well, do that. No, I do not. Uh, Sorry. I don't remember either. So we will send an email to remind everybody, and uh, have a good day. Thanks Thank so much you, for everyone. Coming.